I suppose that reads like I'm a bit of a troublemaker, but uh, I, uh, I think uh, if you look at my record, uh, everywhere I went there was trouble before I got there. Uh, even Swindon Town, Pablo de Canio. And if I tell you that my only, uh, the, only, uh, uh, the, the only reason I was uh, uh, made chair, chair of Swindon Town was that the owner thought that if I dealt with the Taliban, Saddam Hussein, and uh, Bashir of Sudan, Pablo de Canio would be a cakewalk. Uh, but he was much more difficult. <laughs> but it's a great honour for me to be asked to give the second uh, Charles Denman Memorial Lecture. Uh, I knew Charles uh, in his uh, uh, capacity as chair of the Saudi British Society when I was uh, ambassador in Saudi Arabia, and he was a distinguished contributor to furthering British interests overseas well into his 80s, and is remembered fondly by many British ambassadors past and present. Uh, who dealt with him, so it's a particular honour for me to be giving this, this particular lecture. Um, as I left Afghanistan in uh, April 2012, uh, there was a prevailing mood of pessimism among most commentators, based, amongst other things, on the absence of a political process, continued violence, doubts about the ability of the Afghan security forces to take over security from the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, and very high levels of corruption. Uh, most people will argue that little has changed uh, in the past two years. Uh, if anything, the voice of the skeptics has grown louder, even though uh, Afghanistan has to some extent been pushed off the media by events in the Middle East, and indeed I, I go later on uh, this evening to talk about events in Iraq uh, on Newsnight because of the, uh, uh, the events there. So Afghanistan, to some extent, has, has just uh, uh, gone off, the, uh, gone off the, uh, the, the media spotlight. But after spending uh, billions of dollars and, and pounds, the mood is one of impending failure and a return of the Taliban with all that implies for the status and rights of women and, uh, and, uh, and men as well, but uh, focus on status and rights of women. And the idea of a liberal Western democracy where women enjoy equal rights seems no nearer now than it did in 2002. President Karzai was famous, amongst other things, for saying that NATO and ISAF uh, were fighting the wrong war in the wrong place and causing the deaths of many Afghan civilians. His failure to sign a bilateral security agreement with the US raised the prospect of a complete withdrawal of international forces by the end of this year. And given Karzai's attitude, many people in this country questioned what it was all about and was it worth it? President Karzai was prone to such statements, which became more frequent as he approached the end of his tenure. And uh, Sir David Richards here, who was the uh, deputy of ISAF, he will, he will, uh, he will know, uh, uh, he will know all about Karzai's moods. Uh, but he was prone uh, to these statements, and as he approached the end of his tenure, many, including me, thought it was a negotiating tactic to get better terms uh, for whatever else, whatever he was trying to. Uh, to get out of the Americans. They usually can coincided with periods when the Afghans were negotiating with the international community, or more usually the Americans, about something. Karzai was mindful of the need to appeal to his domestic constituency and avoid being seen as the modern day Shah Shuja, uh, a predecessor of Karzai who was put in power by the British in the 19th century and who met a particularly sticky end. Indeed, the Taliban have been quite astute in playing this card, that Karzai is a stooge of the Americans in the way that Shah Shuja was seen as a puppet of the British. Karzai had resorted to his tried and tested method of spreading the responsibility for agreeing to any arrangement with the US by holding a lawyer jirga, the traditional Afghan method of deciding important national issues. He used the same tactic when deciding to form the National Peace Council, at, uh, which was meant to uh, explore talks, peace talks with the Taliban. So it was something of a surprise to the Americans when he declared he would not sign the agreement, which led to the US considering the likelihood of a complete pullout of, of, of American troops, which in effect would have led to a complete pullout of all international troops. There was the possibility, as happened in Iraq, that an agreement would not be reached and all American troops would be withdrawn, even those whom it was envisaged would continue to support the Afghan forces. In such a scenario, uh, all the, as I said, other international forces, including the UK, would also have been withdrawn. But this is not Iraq, and given the events 
of uh, recent events. We should be grateful for that. And given that both candidates involved in the runoff for the presidential election have declared that they will sign the bilateral security arrangement, this possibility, in my mind, has receded. Indeed, President Obama has already announced that over 9,000 troops will stay on after 2014 to conduct counter-terrorism operations and to assist Afghan forces. I do not think he'd made, he would have made such an announcement if he had not had assurances from both the candidates in the runoff that they would sign the bilateral security agreement if elected. However, in the absence of an inclusive political agreement that involves the Taliban, the war will continue and we are likely to leave behind a grinding stalemate between the Afghan government and the Taliban. The Afghan forces, on the evidence so far, are likely to be able to prevent the Taliban taking over as long as the international community continues to pay the multi-billion dollar bill to sustain them. That is particularly important. That, at least, is the one lesson we should learn from the Soviet withdrawal in the 90s, when the Najibullah regime survived for three years after the Soviet troops withdrew, but succumbed to internal strife when funding was withdrawn. The Soviet, uh, Soviet the Russian ambassador in Kabul uh, over copious amounts of vodka was often prone to uh, delight in telling me that we were making all the same mistakes that they made. Uh, and, uh, and to some extent we were making a lot of the same mistakes. But I used to point out to them, the difference is that when we leave Afghanistan, our whole system of government is not likely to collapse and our economies are not likely to go into free fall. And as long as we continue to pay the bills, we should at least avoid the mistake that they made. We shall see. But you will note that I talk of a direction of travel and not a finished product in 2014. Uh, we, are, we, we are talking about a journey. Uh, and uh, this, is not a, this is a waypoint. It's not the end of story, but simply a milestone on a much longer journey. One that I'm sure will be full of setbacks, be messy, and almost certainly sometimes violent. We will not know who will be the new president until later this month, and the inauguration will not be until August. The runoff between Abdullah Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani will take place in a few days. My money would be on Abdullah Abdullah, Abdullah Abdullah winning, but we will not have long to find out. But both candidates, both Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani, are candidates with the potential to lead Afghanistan on a path that holds out the possibility of a constructive relationship with the wider international community. They're both skeptical about the role Pakistan has played in sustaining the Taliban, but are also pragmatic enough to know that engagement with Pakistan will be essential to ending the insurgency and dealing with the myriads of problems facing Afghanistan going forward. The fact that there has been a democratic tr transition with an election with a turnout of, over si of nearly 60% in the first round, despite Taliban efforts to subvert the process, is a remarkable achievement, one that has passed most of our media by. This is, this is a remarkable achievement, uh, the election. Wasn't perfect, but each election you see in Afghanistan is, is better than the last. And I think I, my own view on states that, have to, uh, that are in transition to democracy, it's not the first and second election that you should be worried about. Lots of countries have one or two elections. It's the third and fourth that are the real gauges of whether um, you, the, uh, the, the path to democracy has been embedded. And this has been a remarkable transition. There were many who refused to believe that President Karzai would be prepared to simply hand over power. But he told me many times that he had no ambition to stay on, that he wanted his son to grow up in Afghanistan, and that he had no intention of trying to subvert the Constitution to allow him to uh, stand for a third term. And equally, he did not try to manipulate the process to secure a candidate of his choosing. Most people um, assumed that Zalmi Rasul was his favored candidate, and he, uh, he got less than, he got 15, 17% of the vote, uh, but there was no attempt to try and uh, subvert the process. And I think President Karzai has been as good as his word, and he may have lots of faults, but he, de he deserves 
enormous credit for this. The challenge for the new president will be to deliver what ordinary Afghans want, an end to the insurgency, more transparent government, a reduction in corruption, greater opportunities, economic opportunities, and wider access to education for their children. These are not things that would be unfamiliar to uh, almost any citizen of the Middle East or Europe or, or uh, almost any country in the world. In trying to achieve this, uh, whoever is president will have to manage the realities of Afghanistan's geography and political culture. The center will find it difficult to exercise authority or deliver services in the remoter parts of Afghanistan, as has always been the case. I used to have this debate with Ashraf Ghani, who said, you're trying to uh, develop a dispersed system of government in, in Afghanistan. What we need is, uh, what, uh, what we've had in the past is a strong central government. And I used to say, and when was that, Dr. Ghani? I, can't, I seem to forget, I don't remember that period. And, and if you go out to all the regions of Afghanistan, you see uh, very uh, dispersed uh, systems of government um, and I think uh, uh, that will be a big challenge for the new president but future stability will depend in part on continued delivery of development assistance throughout the country although albeit at reduced levels the president will still need to deal with local power brokers whether in the form of independent governors such as Mohammed Atta and Balkh province or just influential politicians who have grown rich in the past 10 years, such as Gulag Shahzai, the former governor of Jalalabad, or those who have never lost in influence, such as Ismail Khan in Herat. The international community may need to show some patience and forbearance and deal with Afghanistan as it is, rather than as they would wish it to be. In marking the international report card, it's perhaps worth recalling why we went to Afghanistan in the first place. It was not to improve the condition of women or install a parliamentary democracy or even, as Tony Blair was prone to say, to rid Afghanistan of the scourge of drugs. It was to get rid of a regime that had been harboring the headquarters and nerve center of Al-Qaeda, a place from where Al-Qaeda had launched an attack on the Twin Towers in New York killing not only thousands of Americans, but citizens of countries from all over the world, including the UK. The original aim of the international coalition was to overthrow the Taliban and drive out Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan. In this, we have been successful. But like all interventions before, and I believe that will be true of those still to come, and I'm sure there will be some, I don't know where they're gonna be, and I hope they're not in Syria, and I hope they're not in Iraq, but I'm confident there'll be intervention somewhere, that once you've entered the china shop and smashed the crockery, you own it. And it is your responsibility to do something about getting the country back on, the, back on a more stable path. That is unavoidable. There is a responsibility to build something in its place before you leave. The Donald Rumsfeld philosophy, philosophy of a quick military victory and withdrawal is rarely acceptable or practical. But obviously, uh, the, we couldn't, the, the politicians are notorious for raising the stakes in an effort to galvanize public support for such a dangerous and expensive enterprise. It leads to ex exaggerated expectations of what could and should have been done. It's difficult for our leaders to send our young men and women into harm's way uh, without the people uh, behind them. And that does lead to exaggerated uh, expectations. So talk of building institutions, ending corruption, establishing women's rights and parliamentary democracy were all part of a leg legitimate campaign to build public support. But it did lead, as I said, to ex exaggerated expectations. It's not to say that these were not laudable and noble aims or that they were not pursued with vigor, determination and huge resources. I had a huge embassy in, in Kabul and uh, most of my staff were uh, engaged in the pursuit of building institutions, capacity building, development, all the things they said we were there, that they were there to do. But they're not the benchmark against which success 
should have been measured. Little thought was given to the idea that these were not concepts with which Afghanistan had ever been familiar, nor to, took into account the fact that for the last 30 years, Afghanistan had suffered from perpetual conflict, whether it was Soviet invasion, civil war, or the onslaught, onslaught of the Taliban and their subsequent overthrow. It is important to have realistic expectations and accept that Afghanistan, having suffered decades of conflict, is not about to become, after only one decade of international help and their own efforts, a model liberal democracy. Afghanistan, for some time to come, will remain a fragile, unstable state with weak institutions and higher levels of corruption than is healthy for any society. But it's also important to recognize progress. Afghan security forces have taken over responsibility for security in the whole of Afghanistan. During the next six months, the last of the international combat troops will withdraw. So that by the time we reach the end of 2014, the training wheels will be well and truly off. This does not mean that the Afghans will be abandoned. There will still be high levels of support for training and logistics, and more importantly, financial support. ISAF are still, will still be providing training advice and support to the NSF now that the announcement, on the, the announcement of the American troops staying on until at least 2016, and I, I assume soon after a new president is in place, the signature of a bilateral security agreement, which will entrench that. Our troops there are spending less time on the ground in a combat role due to increased capability of the Afghan forces. All the bases in Helmand, except the main base at Camp Bastion, have been handed over to Afghan forces. Increasingly, our focus is on specialist roles such as medical, air and surveillance. I keep seeing we and our um, public service dies hard. I still think I'm part of the government, uh, but um, so uh, please forgive me. Um, UK forces were down to just over 5,000 by the end of 2013 and will gradually reduce to a residual force by the end of this year. The UK is committed to supporting the Afghan National Army's Officer Academy now and beyond 2014. I think we're committed until 2017. Uh, Sandhurst and the Sand, we, we call that a, a, an effort to ensure that the Afghan security forces are properly led. Uh, and uh, uh, and that, is, that will be a major contribution by the UK. Decisions on what further commitments beyond 2014 the UK might make are likely to be announced soon, I would imagine, now that President Obama has committed uh, to keep uh, US forces for uh, uh, 9,000 for a further year and reduce levels beyond that. But I would be surprised if the UK were to keep more than uh, hundreds uh, rather than thousands. I would be surprised if it was more than 1,000 uh, UK forces in Afghanistan beyond 20, 2014. But actually there are people in this room who will have a better idea of what the latest thinking on that is. What optimism I have is based on the international com community being ready to continue over a reasonable period to provide the sort of financial support promised at the NATO summit in Chicago in May 2012 and the Tokyo conference in July of the same year. Uh, we're talking about $4 billion worth of development assistance and about $4 billion worth of um, as direct assistance to the uh, Afghan military. These are the sorts of levels that Afghanistan will, will need over the next three to five, five years. Um, and the, the international community has committed to support Afghanistan after 2014 with those sums, those sums of money. Now, they, I think it's important to uh, the, the, the importance of the bilateral security agreement and the US troops staying on is quite clear because we are talking about sums of money that the US give to Israel. And for the US to continue to sustain that politically, if, they had had, if they'd had to withdraw all their troops from Afghanistan, I think the politics of that would have changed dramatically and it would have been unlikely that that level of financial commitment would have, uh, would have been sustained. So uh, the two things are inextricably linked. For their part, the Afghans will have to show that they continue to be worthy of such support by addressing issues of corruption and by ensuring that the money we provide goes where it's intended on providing security and supporting the country's development needs.
Even though we have fallen well short of the expectations raised when we first went into Afghanistan, there have been some notable achievements. Nearly 6 million children now attend schools, 39% of whom are girls. Under the Taliban, that figure was nil. That investment over the past decade in education cannot fail to have a significant impact in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the problems we all face in Afghanistan, uh, whether it was in, in training the Afghan forces or trying to develop the civil service, was the low levels of literacy and education. Uh, so there was remedial measures required. Ten years of, ten years of, um, of education uh, will begin to, begin to change that dynamic. Nearly half of pregnant women now receive antenatal care at least once during pregnancy, compared to only 16% in 2003. Life expectancy is rising and more, the and more than half the population now live within an hour of a public health facility. That may not seem great to us, but it's pretty good in terms of what Afghanistan faced in 2002. The Afghan government uh, now collects tax revenues of $2 billion, which is an eight-fold increase since 2004. You can't sustain a state and a government unless you can collect some tax to deliver it. And I think if we're all honest about that, we'd recognize that we don't like paying taxes, but it's a pretty fundamental part of sustaining a, a civilized society. Afghanistan's real GDP has increased on average by 9% per annum since 2001. So there has been progress. It's not all bad news. Even if the levels of foreign assistance promised are delivered, this will still be considerably less than has been the norm during the past 10 years. In my own view, a reduction in aid budgets and military pur purchases should lead to clearer priorities amongst donors and Afghans alike. I actually welcome the reduction in the amount of money sloshing around the Afghan economy. I think it's been very distorting, and I think lower levels will help the Afghan economy on a, on a glide path to a, a more sustainable uh, longer term future. Hard pressed Afghan ministries should be in a better position to manage and control funds and a smaller number of projects have a better chance of being properly monitored and evaluated. A reduction in the enormous aid flows that we have seen could offer an, an opportunity for a stronger development of the private sector which has been inhibited to some extent by the easy money around for so long. But the challenges will be formidable. The agricultural sector has been relatively neglected, despite its importance for the economy and livelihoods, and sustaining high-level Afghan human capacity on normal public sector salaries will not be easy. Despite economic growth and other progress since 2001, the country remains amongst the poorest in the world, and social in indicators are amongst the worst in the world. After years of investment in combating poppy cultivation, production of, of heroin in Afghanistan has not been reduced. Much has been made of the absence of a political process, but it takes two parties to talk, and so far the Taliban have shown little interest in participating in a genuine political process. Despite the current campaign of terrorism and violence, I think it's designed to show that the Taliban are still a force to be reckoned with. I think there is some prospect of a political process in the future. I was encouraged by the statement attributed to a senior Taliban figure by Michael Sempo. You may remember the EU official who was thrown out of Afghanistan essentially for ahead of getting ahead of the government and trying to talk to the Taliban. But he, he, he was, uh, this Taliban figure said that the Taliban no longer believed it could achieve power by force. I've been saying this for some time. Uh, I think it was important to uh, show the Taliban that they could, they could not repeat what they did in the, uh, in, in the mid-90s and that for them, uh, in the same way as the, I, uh, the ISAF and the Afghans could not destroy the Taliban completely uh, by, uh, uh, through military means alone, likewise the Taliban could not win by military means and would have to come if they wanted to share in the political process, they would have to become a part of it. Reconciliation with the Taliban is possible, but it will take time and will be very difficult. And we should be prepared to be patient. 
there is a large element of mistrust on all sides, a history of failed attempts, and each, each side unsurprisingly doubts the sincerity of the others. It's not hard to see when uh, one, a good friend, Pr Professor Rabani, who was chair of the, chair of the Afghan Peace Council, uh, was assassinated by a Taliban uh, so-called negotiator who had hidden a bomb in his turban uh, and had turned up to uh, conduct peace talks with the chair of the Higher Peace Council. So it's unsurprising that uh, uh, you, you might be a little bit, uh, a, a little bit sceptical. But there are a number of factors that should give uh, some uh, rays of hope. The withdrawal of combat troops will offer opportunities, uh, foreign combat troops will offer opportunities for reconciliation. Removing the insurgents foreign invader uh, rallying call, it's, the, the Taliban will find it very difficult to continue to uh, pretend that they are, uh, they are uh, the nationalists uh, trying to get rid of foreign invaders. They'll be more, much more clearly fighting uh, their own people. Enough significant and senior Taliban appear to be interested in a negotiated outcome. There is an element of war weariness, and they are facing pressure from within the, their movement and from local Afghan communities sick of the war. Resentment at Pakistani manipulation for their own ends is growing, and a fear of a regeneration of an anti an, a, and fear of a regeneration of an anti-Taliban coalition backed by the West. The U.S. appears to be more interested in a political settlement uh, since they have uh, stopped looking at the Taliban and al-Qaeda as one amorphous organization. Uh, and in any case, as the U.S. withdraws, the focus will be more on the Afghans to find a solution. I think the release of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl in exchange for five senior Taliban being held in Guantanamo was originally one of the early steps uh, along uh, in an attempt to get a peace process going which involved the opening of the Doha office, but uh, that was blown off track by the, uh, the Taliban asserting, uh, uh, asserting that they were a, a government in exile and because of the suspicions of President Karzai. But that was one of the early steps in trying to bring the Taliban into, into, into a process. And there is a degree of convergence amongst internal parties in Afghanistan who want to avoid a civil war prefer law and order and the protection of national sovereignty. And it is likely that as the presidential election approached, there was little in it for the Taliban to make peace with the outgoing president. So it's hardly surprising that there weren't great efforts towards peace. Why make peace with an outgoing president when you'll soon have a, uh, you'll soon have a new president in, in place? Um, Abdullah Abdullah is no friend of the Taliban, but equally he will find it easier to bring along the northerners if a deal is to be struck. And equally, prospects of divisions amongst the northerners, a, a factor which allowed the Taliban a free run into Kabul in the 1990s, are absent. So it's also important to acknowledge the key role that Pakistan has to play. Both Afghanistan and Pakistan need to recognize that their long-term prosperity and security depends on maintaining a good relationship with each other and cooperating to deal with the threat they both have from the Taliban and the recent attack on Karachi Airport uh, by the, uh, uh, the TTP uh, brings that home about the, 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 the difficulties facing uh, Pakistan from the same source on the other side of the border. A stable Afghanistan requires a peaceful border between Afghanistan and Pakistan and security on either side in which violent extremists are rooted out and prevented from operating as freely as they currently are able to. Pakistan need, as I say, need to work together. This has not always been the case with the Pakistani ISI in particular developing links with extreme, extremist groups such as the Haqqani Network and others as part of, in my view, a misplaced strategic aim of denying India a foothold or influence in Afghanistan. I think this is increasingly short-sighted, and an active role by Pakistan in promoting reconciliation with the Taliban will be important. I know that's controversial, and uh, probably we can, we'll have a discussion about that later. The UK has played a modest role in bringing uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan together by facilitating meetings between the uh, 
new Pakistani uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, and President Karzai, and and these and keeping these contacts up contacts up will be important. Reconciliation with the Taliban is necessary, but insufficient in itself to guarantee stability. After nearly 12 years in, of engagement, there is little more that the international community can do to ensure a better outcome beyond continuing to provide financial support and completing an orderly transition. The onus is on the Afghans, and they have, they have played their part in turning out in huge numbers to elect a new president. I repeat, a very significant event. Before the elections, Michael Keating, former Deputy UN Special Representative and now Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House, said, we can expect a bruising campaign and, a flawed, and flawed elections, but the outcome must, might just turn out to be better than the pessimists predict. He was spot on. There is no doubt that corruption has invaded every aspect of Afghan life, and no doubt was evident in the elections, but not to the extent that the result can be questioned as a legitimate expression of the will of the Afghan people. Access to justice remains limited, but these things are not new to Afghanistan. What is new is that Afghanistan has a lively and free media, high levels of civil society activism, and millions of IT savvy and increasingly urbanized young people who demand a better future. With over six million children in full-time education, as I said, this will have a profound influence on the future direction Afghanistan takes. The past decade has seen the growth of a young, educated class expecting jobs and a more transparent political system. Even the Taliban are beginning to recognize that Afghanistan has changed in the last decade so any agreement will need to respect Afghanistan's constitutional framework, which includes protection for women and, other, and others and, and, and minorities. We need to get away from the focus on the short term. Ashraf Ghani often used to tell me that when he was in charge of the, when he was in charge of the transition commission, that we needed a, to move away from six-month improvisation and ten-year un, unimplementable visions. We needed something in the middle. There is a need for a time frame that gives time for serious planning, but is near enough to concentrate the mind. The, critic, the critiques are often dominated by short-term analysis. Britain began its path to democracy in 1215, when we were going to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta. And we were still at it in 1921 when women's suffrage was introduced. It is possible to look at Afghanistan and see some of the ingredients for stability and equilibrium, but it's a long way down the road. But this will not look like any European country. It will be an Afghan model. This is the only sustainable way. We need genuine Afghan solutions, so the international community getting out of the way will, in my view, have positive effects. Afghan security forces are already cooperating with local people and coming to local agreements that we might not have uh, we might not have um, felt were right when we were there. Some of these local people might be regarded as insurgents, and local people may be hedging their bet bets, but it was ever thus in Afghanistan. We need to put more faith in the Afghans themselves being able to craft their own solutions, and in some cases the outcome may not be entirely to our liking. For those of you who have been to Afghanistan, you will know that it's a harsh place, with its mountainous centre, the Hindu Kush, running right through it. It's a country dependent on agriculture, but only 12% of the land is cultivable. There are large expanses of desert, and geographical factors push up the costs of any development ac activity and the cost of infrastructure. The economy is weather dependent, even under the most optimistic scenario that anybody would care to paint, Afghanistan will remain a poor country. There has hardly ever been a period when Afghanistan has not been dependent on some form of external assistance, but Afghanistan has taken great strides in development over the last 10 years. I mentioned earlier the progress in education, but also in building roads and other communications. The National Solidarity Programme has been a success. A system for improved collection of national taxes has been put in place, and there is an embryonic civil service. 
Institutions take decades to mature and develop, and we should not be too quick to judge in 2014 and think that this is the end point. There is lots that can go wrong in Afghanistan, and it's possible to see the glass as half empty. But in the wake of the successful transition to a new president, it's permissible to think of the glass as half full. The Afghans are a resourceful and resilient people, and they deserve our support. And I think the, if there's one message I would leave you tonight is uh, that we need to continue to put the pressure on our politicians as their attention shifts to other parts of the world to deliver on our commitments to maintain that financial support and the more limited military support that we're going to provide beyond 2014. If we do that, I don't know how Afghanistan will turn out. But what I can say is if we don't, I'm pretty certain what will happen. I think we'll see a very rapid reversion to instability uh, and uh, insurgency. Uh, so I, I can predict with some certainty what would happen if we don't provide the support. The future remains uncertain, but there is, there is some hope. I'm, I'd, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.